how do I intend to organize this session? Um, the first, how do I change the slide? Okay, so uh, I'll be talking a little bit, I'll be introducing containers and Docker for like the first 30 minutes. And then I will give you a tutorial with an interactive demonstration of Docker itself and the Docker engine from my laptop. Then we will have our break um, around, uh, after like one hour and a half, we'll have our 15 minute break. And then we'll come back with the second part of the lecture where we will tackle more specifically the, the, the usage of containers on HPC systems using with the Sarus container engine. Uh, the, all the slides and the code I will be using during the live demo are available at the uh, GitHub repository. You see here, there is a link also on the summer school homepage about the material for the virtual lab, which is uh, also part of this repository. And then I, uh, the lab is introduced by uh, a video for which, uh, for the sake of completeness, I linked here as well. The video is very kindly uh, provided by Simon, uh, for which I acknowledge the, the effort. Thank you very much. Um, okay, without further ado, uh, let's let's get in, let's get into it. So, the first question that we have to answer is, what is a container? We say we talk about containers, but what are they? Well, um, this is not always um, an easy question to answer because containers are can can be many different things for different people. And there is a high chance that if you ask the same the, this question to different people, you will get different answers. So for the intent and purposes of this lecture and from a perspective of an application developer, let's say we can define, con we can define containers as isolated environments to run applications and services. They are created from images which, which include all the software dependencies needed to execute said applications. Containers are prescriptive, they are portable, easy to build, and quick to deploy. Uh, but from these sentences, you might just say, mm, but what you're talking about sounds very much like a, a virtual machine. So what's the difference? Um, the difference is pretty funda is pretty substantial in reality, and the, the the drawing in the slide helps us understand a little bit more. So on the left side of the drawing, you can uh, we have a virtual machine where on top of the uh, let me use the pointer on top of the hardware and the host operating system, uh, the hardware is uh, we have another layer of virtualization where the operating the complete operating system a complete operating system called a guest and also another virtualized layer of hardware is created so that's how a virtual machine operates under a hypervisor it recreates virtual hardware and recreates a complete virtual operating system including a virtual kernel containers have none of that in fact containers share the hardware of the host system, and they also share the kernel, the operating system kernel of the host system, and they just run the applications on top of it. This makes containers um, use much less resources from the host system uh, in terms of memory and cycle, so they, 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 they are snappier, and they also start up uh, much quicker because there is no need to, to do a boot up process or a shutdown process. So their management is much more nimble. They're much swifter. Um, on the other hand, the counterpart is that you don't have the flexibility of choices that um, a virtual machine gives you. Like if you want to run a kernel, which is not the same as the one on the host system, or if you want to, C4 CPUs instead of two, let's say, just, just an example. 
So for this reason that containers are much leaner on resources, they are sometimes also called uh, a, a lightweight virtualization technology. Um, they are also classified as uh, OS virtual uh, operating system level virtualization because the features of the of the con of containers are really enabled by the operating system and are tied to the oper to the host operating system. Specific more specifically, during this lecture, we will be referring to Linux containers, so containers created uh, with the Linux operating system. On Linux, containers are, are enabled by abstraction features provided by the Linux kernel, which are called namespaces, uh, which are able to isolate processes from the rest of the system. If you're really interested in, in, in getting a little bit deeper in understanding what makes containers tick, uh, I recommend you read this uh, series of article at Linux Weekly News about the namespaces. Uh, it gets technical, but it's a it's a very uh, it's an enlightening read if you want to uh, to know to know the the details. Um, an another thing that imp that's important to note is that since they they rely on features of the kernel, then Containers are not an exclusive invention of any uh, group, organization, or company. Uh, they, um, they really all reuse these building blocks provided by Linux itself. Uh, but since the, these building blocks themselves are quite a low level, there are a lot of ways they can be used, mixed, and matched. And so, over the years, different design decisions and use cases uh, gave the rise to several container solutions, which are the programs or the products that we find around in the ecosystem, from the early LXC or Rocket to Docker, which is by far the most popular container implementation, uh, Podman, and then in, here on the left side we see more generic uh, container uh, container software, and then we also have a class of more HPC-focused container technologies like Shifter, Singularity, Charlie Cloud, and Saros. So as you can see, that the ecosystem is quite varied and is quite active. It's quite dynamic as well. Uh, we'll be focusing, as I said, on the HPC side on the second part of the lecture. So for now, let's just focus on Docker. So Docker is the most currently the most popular container implementation by far. Um, I'm not really following the numbers anymore, but I, I read surveys like uh, one or two years ago that estimated that like the adoption rate of Docker was over 80%, probably even over 90%, meaning of all the people that and organizations that were using containers, more than 80% of them use a Docker or, or had come in contact with Docker. So the popularity is such that some people even use Docker as synonymous for containers, even if, as we, uh, we just said, that's not completely appropriate. So there are, many, uh, there are many reasons for the success of Docker, uh, but, I would like, but here I would like to highlight two of them that from uh, a, a user point of view make, make a difference. So the first one is a easy to use authoring tool uh, because Docker gives you the, the, um, the possibility to create images from recipe-like files, just a sequence of commands. And then once the images have been created, they can be named, they can be labeled, and you, uh, they can be just uh, built on top of already existing images. So there's a lot of modularity in there. The second point is 
the adoption of a cloud-based image, image distribution, distribution strategy because the Docker software and the Docker client already includes features to uh, authenticate to, uh, to remote hosts and push and, and, and exchange images with what are called remote registries. So registries are out platforms uh, that store and uh, exactly uh, redistribute images. And the um, one, one of the biggest and the most popular of them is Docker Hub, which is the default used by, by Docker and is maintained by the Docker company itself. Docker proposes a workflow that in its most basic form is, um, is composed of three steps. The first one, an image is created on, on a machine like even a common laptop using a Docker file, which is the recipe-like file we, we mentioned before. The, once it's been created, the image is then uploaded or pushed, if we want to use the jargon, it gets pushed to a remote registry in the cloud. And as we already said, the default one is Docker Hub maintained by Docker. Once the image is on the cloud, another computer, always using Docker, can download or pull the image, also in the, always in the Docker jargon, pull the image on, a tar on, the, on this target machine and run the container created from the image. Um, so I mentioned, uh, since the beginning of, of the talk, I mentioned images and containers, and, but what, more specifically, what is an image? What, what do we intend with a container image? And what's the relationship with, a, with containers themselves? Uh, this is kind of a key point to understand, so let's dig a little bit deeper into it. An image is defined as a standalone and executable package that includes everything that's needed to run a piece of software. So meaning the, the runtime libraries it, it needs, the code that's used to compile it, the configuration files. While the container is a process isolated from the rest of the systems through the abstractions created by the kernel. And the content, the, the, for example, the file system in which this process moves in, the, the content that this process has access to depends on what's defined on the image. So the image is this uh, software stack that you can move around very easily between between various computers and then it is the task of a container runtime or a container engine like docker to take this image and spawn a uh, an isolated process from it and this process is the container another perhaps even more intuitive way of seeing this is that the container can be thought of as the in runtime instance of an image it's what the image becomes in the memory when the application in, in, inside is executed. Um, okay, so these, these are the, the definitions uh, as they are, but more in more concrete, more practical terms, how are containers useful? Well, containers gives as they give us the possibility to create applications and scientific applications because that's what we are here for that are for example uh, that have these four properties let's say they are portable they are prescriptive easy to deploy and easy to test and i'm going to go briefly over each of these points so with the applications uh, the containerized applications are portable because the images are self-sufficient. An image is everything that's needed to start a container and to start and to run a containerized application. And this means that using containers, 
we can prevent dependency conflicts. So those situations where two different applications need uh, different need the same dependency, for example, a library, but in two different versions that are conflicting with each other. And sometimes on native computing systems, this is a problem because you not have two conflicting libraries, but different applications require different versions of them. Um, another thing that the, uh, that the uh, that prevented it is the so-called works in my computer bug, where the same applications works for one researcher on one computer, but not on all the others in the team, because maybe this person has done, has installed some software or has done some configuration that maybe he doesn't remember uh, remember anymore. But with with uh, but by sharing these portable images, containers can can uh, circumvent the, these problems. Containers are prescriptive. Um, in the sense that uh, prescriptive in the sense of set documenting. Images are created from recipe files that specify what's, uh, what's inside the image and how it was compiled. So just by creating the image, we already have a piece of code because these recipe files are code can be version controlled as such that gives us all the details of how that software stack was created. And so, uh, for example, there, the, the, the risk of somebody figuring out how to make a piece of software work and then leaving the team and nobody else knows how uh, how to make that stuff work anymore is greatly diminished, because as I said, just by compiling the uh, just by compiling the application inside an image, we have already created the documentation for it. It leaves a trace. Containers are easy to deploy, exactly because because the images are all that is needed. So I just you. Uh, I just need to download the image or computer and then with a one liner I can run a container from it. And as I said, uh, it starts upon a matter of seconds. There's no provisioning, there is no boot up. It's it's all very it's very, very snappy. And then uh, containers give us the capability of having applications that are easy to test. Not because something happens to the applications themselves, but think about having an image with all the dependencies of an application already compiled and installed. You have the possibility of having a, an environment which is completely clean of build artifacts or test artifacts that would influence the way the code is built, or the tests are done. So a completely clean environment with uh, predictable contents with all the uh, where you don't have to spend time in recompiling libraries. And it starts within seconds. And you can just uh, mount your code from the host. You can copy the code of the host inside inside the this image and and you can start compiling and testing right away. So it chops off uh, a lot of uh, of the overhead and in the inconveniences of, of creating tests environments. Okay, uh, I, I've been talking a, a little bit of Docker, of containers in general, and Docker more specifically. I hope that I was clear enough in in laying out the foundation, in explaining some key concepts. And now let's see the things in action to get a, get a real feel on how, what, uh, what's about, um, what's like 
to use containers and to use Docker. So give me just a second to share my computer. Um, yeah, maybe maybe it's uh, I can I can answer a few questions. I am a little bit going in the material a little bit faster than I expected. So I've seen that there are two questions. Uh, so we have a question from Alina. Should we understand this as general system-wide equivalent to what a virtual environment is for Python? Um, more, more or less, yes. It's much more complete than a virtual environment for Python uh, because you, you really snapshot everything in the file system that it's, it's of importance for your application. Uh, and, and then you also build your application inside it. So yes, it's not that different from a virtual environment, but it is much more um, organic. It's much more high, higher scope. Uh, then there's a question from Nico. Do, do containers also add a compatibility layer that allows to run the same application on top of different OS? Um, uh, if I understand correctly, you, uh, you're asking if I can create an image with a different operating system and run it on top of a different Linux distribution. So yes, that is, uh, that is actually what happens, uh, what happens all the time because the images are based on a Linux distribution of your choice or, or developer choice and regardless of uh, what is the operating system on the host the uh, the container is run because through the abstractions created by the container by the kernel the process inside the container has no idea of what's actually the, the native operating system of the machine. So I think we can combine these two aspects that the, some sort of compatibility layer, even if that's not a completely appropriate, and the, uh, and the capturing all the dependencies like in a Python environment to create this this context where our applic where applications can be can can be compiled and run regardless of what's inside the um, what's inside the actual uh, computer host. Uh, okay, so let me share my. Uh, let's move on to the, I'll now move on with the live demo and I'll pick up some more questions during, at the, at the end of our presentation. I hope that's, that's fine. Um, okay. Okay. Can you see my, my terminal? I hope that. Okay, so here we are on a terminal in my laptop. We have Docker available. Oh, sorry. Starting out with a typo, not my final day. We have Docker with the latest version, 1903. And let's try to do something with it. So you may remember that I mentioned in the basic Docker workflow, there are three steps. So let's try to start with, with that going over the, the complete workflow. So the first thing that we need to do is to, um, uh, or the first thing that we, that we can do with Docker is to pull an image from, um, from, uh, a remote register from the cloud in order to create a container. 
and we do this with docker pull and then we need to supply an image identifier so i will just go with debian the uh, the free uh, linux distribution based on open source software launch this command okay it was very quick uh, because i i already had it and it says i downloaded an image okay but where did it download it from so as i said before the default okay the default platform that docker will contact in order to retrieve images is docker hub and let's get a little bit more familiar with docker hub um, so let's open a, a browser let's go to hub.docker.com So here we are on Docker Hub. It's already logged in in my user. And if I just list the most popular images that are available on Docker Hub, we, we can see that there are a runtime environment for Java, for example, a bunch of databases, Alpine and Ubuntu, so plain Linux distributions, Node.js, uh, JavaScript runtime, web servers, language language images like Python or Golang. There's a lot of stuff. And this is all prepackaged, readily available software that you can take images and use it out, out of the box. Uh, okay. So here Docker says that it download it downloaded an image but how can we be sure uh, how can we list the images that are available on this computer in order to be executed we can list images with the docker images command um, you can see i have quite a few <laughs> the images are listed indicating the repository they come from the tag and i'll explain what it is in a little bit in image ADD, when it was created and the size. So looking a little bit closer of the images I just downloaded. Oh, here it is the Debian image I just got. So let's run a container from this image. Quite intuitively, the only thing that's needed is the, the common docker run then the image identifier and then a command that we want to execute inside the container let's just print the information of the operating system by printing out the content of the etsy os release file release and it replies this is indeed Debian 10 buster but how can we be sure that this actually executed inside a container well if I run the same command natively we see that this computer is in reality a CentOS Linux 7 so a, a, a Linux distribution that's quite different from Debian so we're sure that this actually was containerized and executed in, in, a, in a different context. So this is the way we can execute con uh, commands inside containers. But sometimes, especially when things don't work as we expected, it is useful to have an interactive shell inside a container so that we can look around, see uh see what's happening see the stuff and debug a little bit and understand maybe why a container is not uh, behaving as we expected we can create an interactive shell inside the container excuse me by al always using docker run then we add the options 
dash IT, I stands for interactive, and T stands for uh, open a TTY, then the image identifier, and then let's just run a bash shell inside the container. Okay, here we have a prompt and we are de facto inside the container. The first thing that we notice is that we are the root user, even if outside the container we were not. Um, and this is pretty much the default for, for Docker if uh, different users were not defined in the image. It will default to the root user. So I'm located in the file system root. This is the container file system tree and yeah. And I can see that I am inside my Debian container. So we're pretty much free to do whatever we, we can do with a normal shell inside here. And once we are finished, we can just hit control D or exit and get out of the container. Oh, uh, another th uh, one thing that I forgot to mention was I started the demo. All the, all the examples and all the things I am showcasing uh, here, actually all but one, all but the last one, uh, are covered by the virtual lab. So uh, you don't need exactly to take note of everything, of every little detail that I'm doing because you will have plenty of chance to go over them at your own pace during the lab. So if you want to follow along closely, it's uh, very welcome. Otherwise, you can enjoy the ride. <laughs> Um, okay, um, okay, now we have seen how to run containers and how to retrieve images, but so far we've been running only with Debian 10. Um, but what if I want a different version of Debian and 10 is not really what, what I want. Well, uh, different versions of the of images in Docker are handled with what what's called tags. Tags are suffixes to image names that are entered after a colon. So, for example, if I want Debian stretch, that that's the one of uh, the the version, the previous version of Debian. And I can pull that. Oh, we see that it's downloading the layer. A little bit of patience. And it's extracting layer. And then the image is ready. And now we can try to run it. And as we can see, this is the Debian 9 stretch. So with tags, we can move around the versions of, of images. But how, how do we know which tags are available? In order to do that, let's get back to Docker Hub. Uh, oh. Very quickly. So if I go in the page for the Debian image, and usually, the, the, the web pages for the images on Docker Hub also list what are available tasks for them. So maybe, if I, maybe I should increase the font to be to look clearer. These are the tags. And as you can see, we have Debian 10, which is latest, or 
Buster and all the others. Um, special mention about the, the latest tag. Um, when when an ident when a tag is not specified, Docker will default it to latest. So when we pulled, we just pulled the Debian image before we were really pulling Debian latest. This is Docker default, but it it is customary that the latest tag points to the most recent stable version of that image. And as we have seen for Debian, that would be Debian 10. Uh, another, uh, to complete the uh, to complete the explanation of of image identifiers, so far we have seen the form. We have seen the image name and the tag. In reality, there is a, a there is a higher level of, of hierarchy where we can also specify a user or a repositor namespace which is separated with a slash from the image name. And this is useful to uh, to pull images which are not officially uh, which are not considered official images from Kerhub. So you might see here on Docker Hub, that, that there are there there are images which are identified as official images. These official images are supported by Docker Hub and the Docker company, and so they are considered default images for uh, a, a give uh, for a given software. As such, you do not need to specify uh, a user for them. So pulling just with the image and tag, you will get the default image. But if I want to but if I want to access my own images, for example from a specific user that in this case is myself, uh, let's get back to Docker Hub. I'm sorry for this back and forth. <laughs> Uh, if you go to the my own uh, images that I have stored on Docker Hub, and if I want to pull, for example, this Fedora variant that I created, I need to supply my user, the image name, and the tags. So here to so let's do that just to show how it is. I have to enter my user, Madix, Fedora, the name of the image, and then the tag, which is 32 debug tools. And then this starts, uh, it starts retrieving the layer uh, all over again. Okay, this is taking a little bit longer than I intended. <laughs> it's extracting the layer. Okay, and we query And we look in in Docker images to check if downloaded. What am I doing wrong? Should be here. It is the image that that, that I just downloaded. Uh, here it lists that it's five weeks old because it was created back then. So the created 
the the timestamp here, the created timestamp, is that is not the um, is not when you downloaded the images, but when the image the image was originally created. Uh, okay, so we have seen how to pull images from the cloud, how to start containers, how to uh, start interactive shells inside containers, but in reality, what we want to do is to create our own images to run our own software, because that's where things start to get interesting. Um, and for example, uh, let, let's, let's, uh, let's do that with an example. So I have this small script here. I have a small batch script which will print the contents of a directory called slash app. It will check if, the, if a package wget is installed with, the, uh, with a package manager, and then it will print the value of an environment variable called name. So I want to create, to package the script into an image and run it into a container. Docker has the capability of creating images by itself, but we need a way to tell it what's the content of an image. And we do so, and uh, we can do so by writing a Docker file, which is, which is the recipe file I've been mentioning all the way, all, all, all along. Docker, the Docker files are a sequence of commands. Uh, which incrementally build the image one step at a time. They're not substantially different from bash scripts or from shell scripts, if you want to think like that, with the addition of specific keywords that are called um, instructions. Every command in a Docker file must start with an instruction. The instruction that opens the Docker file is, oh, sorry, is the from instruction. With this instruction, this instruction identifies an already available image as base image. Oh, latest. What this means is that everything, everything else that we will write inside this Docker file will be added on top of what's already defined into the base image, in this case, Debian latest. So we will be adding stuff onto the Debian operate, the Debian base uh, distribution image. Let's try to build this very minimal Docker file. We can do so with Docker build, with a minus T option, we can already assign, we can already label this image. We can already assign an identifier, and I'm gonna name it with my user. Then I'm gonna call it my script, and for the sake of being explicit, latest. The last argument to Docker build is the location where the image building will, will happen the directory where the build will happen, which usually is the current directory. So let's start. Right. That was very quick because effectively the only thing that the from command will do is that this my, uh, this my script image is basically a Debian image, but it, it's only with a, with a different label, so to speak. Um, let, let's have a look. In fact, and, and yes, we, we can verify that effectively the image that I just created is based on Debian 10. I want to get my script into this into this image. So let's get back into the Docker file and do just that. 
the way we can we can import files and directories from the host system and into the image is with the copy instruction the copy instruction will take as first argument the look the path to a file in the host and copy it to another path into the image in this case I'm asking to copy the script.sh file into a location called slash app in the image if the target location does not there is no problem because it will be created by docker save and exit rebuild again okay the copy has been successfully uh, the, the copy instruction has been carried out so now I should be able to run my script inside the image right let's try that I remember and I remember that I copied my script into slash up script dot sh let's go up oh, and what's this I got a permission denied error mm, let's see what's happening here so let's print the content of my slash app directory in the container oh silly me <laughs> I, I have forgot to give execution permissions to the script so I have to change the permissions in order to execute the script let's do that and back into the docker file so hopefully uh, at this stage you are getting the feeling that sometimes developing a docker file is an iterative process and yes that's uh, that's completely n normal especially when tackling new stuff new software which uh, which maybe is even very complex so that's basically what happens also when working natively you try uh, you try to build the things if it doesn't work you see what's wrong and you get back and tweak the script and you go you go, uh, you go step by step from there so changing the permissions to um, changing the permissions to our, uh, to our little script we to do so we use the run instruction the run instruction basically executes a command as if it was run into a shell uh, the flexibility given by this feature makes the run instruction the most used instruction in docker files and usually run instructions make up the bulk of of, of the actual files because they are the ones that actually uh, make changes happen so with the run we can execute the chmod utility to change the permissions we set the permissions to app my script uh, sorry no just script dot sh let's rebuild and now hopefully it now hopefully it runs yes success <laughs> uh, I we uh, I have achieved initial success in running my little script in a in an in a container with an image that I just created so we see that the slash app directory is correctly detected and the, the contents are printed out but it seems that wget is not installed and the, the the dollar name environment variable is empty so let's fix that first I, I want to install I want to use the package manager to install the wget package so 
we use another run instruction and the first thing that you do is apt get update why why am i doing this because uh, by the way docker the, uh, due to the way docker builds images the package manager cache is reset on every every time it uh, uh, an instruction from the docker file is executed so the apt package manager which is the package manager for debian the distribution that we are using needs to explicitly update its cache there are other package managers like for example yum or dnf which are able to automatically take care of this but with apt uh, we have to use update explicitly so remember uh, whenever you use uh, a package manager to refresh the cache after we've done so we can use apt get install always say yes and do not install anything else command and the wget package we are after save and exit and now we rebuild and now we see that the package manager has sprung into action and it's it's updating and this is running inside our image as part of the build process you might be familiar with the output of apt and yeah it's finished install it's finished installing and the image has been successfully completed so now let's run the script again and now the script is able to detect wget which is here with all its siblings so the final step that we need in order to finish the workflow of my script is to add an environment variable we can add environment variables inside docker images with the env instruction env it takes two arguments the first one is the name of the environment variable and the second one is the value so given this is my image i will put alberto which is my name save rebuild this way and you can see um, and you can see that this was very quick the package manager did not run again so what happened here uh, it happened that every time that docker successfully executes uh, a command from the docker file it caches the resulting image the resulting layer and if uh, so that it is able to reuse it when building successful uh, when building additional modification to the images so what happens is that this docker build cache can greatly reduce the time that it's needed to build images which already have parts which have already uh, which I already have parts that have been successfully built the way this cache is is looked up is by comparing the lines of the docker file if the lines are identical then there is a cache match and the cache is reused but for example if I modified let's say the st uh, step number three if, if, if instead of a five uh, of a five five I wrote a seven seven five then the cache lookup would fail for this line the cache would be invalidated and every layer from from every step from three all the way to the end all the subsequent one would have to be rebuilt explicitly 
special special attention should be taken when when we use the copy instruction because the files that we import with a copy instruction are checksummed and the cache lookup mechanism also looks at this checksum to perform cache validation in simpler terms what this means is that even if the docker file is absolutely identical but the contents of the files that we are copying like the contents of script sh were changed the uh, the cache lookup would still fail and the rebuild the complete rebuild would trigger from that point onwards so morale of the story be aware that of the docker build cache know how it works and use it to your advantage to reduce the time it takes to build images okay so now we should have completed all the things required by the little script to run let's verify that the contents of the app directory is there wget is there and the value of dollar name is alberto all right we have we have gotten to the end of the of the script execution and it's all good i am very happy of this image and so happy that actually i want to share with with someone else and the way i and the way i do it is by uploading it to a registry in this case docker hub so let's see how can, how we can upload stuff to docker hub the first thing that uh, uh, that i have to do or to do so is to log in with my own docker hub user to be sure that the that i have the rights to push an image to the to the repositories owned by my user can do so by using so first I log out of any uh, previous uh, credentials may have been entered in by docker uh, and then I log in again with the docker login command I enter my username and my password login successful so now I can push or upload my image to docker hub with docker push and the image identifier and we can see that the layer the different components of the image are processed and uploaded takes a little bit more time and the pool seemingly has been completed let's go over to my docker hub repository to see if this is the case uh, let's refresh and here it is my script image upload updated a few seconds ago so <clears throat> we have seen uh, we have gone from pulling an image that someone else has created from 
from Docker Hub, from the cloud. We have seen how to run containers. And now we have created our own image and we have seen how to push it to the, registry, to the cloud registry so that other people will be able to retrieve it and use the, uh, uh, to retrieve this image and use them somewhere else, of course. Uh, I have seen, let, let's see if I can, so this kind of completes the basic actions that we can perform with, with Docker. So, um, let, let's see how we can do some housekeeping with Docker, like uh, seeing what can, uh, uh, a little bit of maintenance to keep our, uh, our Docker system a little bit um, tidy. So we can have a look at which containers are running with Docker PS. Oh, sorry, I have to, I have to activate the, the, the daemon beforehand. Oh. Oh. Okay, so I was saying, Docker PS will show which containers are running on my system. It seems that there are none, but is that really the case? Hmm. Let's have a look at, uh, if we use the Docker PS with the A option, it will show all the containers, not just the running ones. And yeah, we see that I have not, have been not very disciplined and left a lot of containers around. But why is that? Well, with Docker, when a container finishes to perform the command that we requested to it, it's, it is not destroyed. It is not removed. Rather, it remains in an exited state in exited status, as it says here, and it is ready to be resumed to execute other commands if we wish so. And this makes a lot of sense if, um, if you think about using uh, containers to run services, where, for example, when something goes wrong, you don't want the, the container to disappear immediately, but you want to maybe be put in a, in a dormant state so that you can then log back in, figure out what's broken and restart the service once again without losing the context of, of something that has been running for maybe a, a long time. But in, in my local machine, in my local computer, I have no interest of, um, of keeping these containers around also because they even even if they are in this exited state they occupy some system resources especially some disk space so i want to get rid of them and i can do so by using docker rm shorthand for docker remove and by supplying either the container id or one of the names of of the containers so and we can see that these the first two containers are no longer in the list but um, it can if you have a, if if you have a sizable number of containers you want to remove in this state, it, it is kind of tedious to enter all the identifiers one at a time. So here's a, here's a useful trick. You can do docker rm 
and then you just nest a command of docker ps dash aq dash a will list all the available containers and q is the quiet quiet output providing only the container id so this will be expanded into a list of container ids which will then be picked up by docker rm and so with this neat one liner i just cleaned up all my unused containers all right uh, having taken care of some basic container uh, housekeeping um, let's go let, let's talk about some hpc stuff because in the end this is always this is still an school about hpc and use of effective hpc so let's see how we can use some of the defining traits or defining features of hpc within containers and i'll be showcasing examples uh, about mpi and nvidia gpus so regarding mpi i have this hello world program which is made by uh, which is made of a c source code a very short main function it will retrieve the number of processes it will retrieve the rank of one specific pr the, of the executing process and then print up hello world message from all of the mpi ranks that i want to launch this source this program can be compiled with the accompanying make file which uses the mpi compiler wrapper and simply calls the the mpi compiler over the source code and that's basically all there is to it so it's a it's an extremely it's an hello world example exactly <laughs> very very simple and i want to run this mpi hello world inside a container so as we have seen the first step is to create an image we and i have already prepared a docker file for it so we base the docker file from debian buster again we use the package manager to install the compilation tool chains and the wget utility we then use wget to retrieve mpitch 314 version 314 which is an mpi implementation which is then extracted and compiled from source and we need to do this because in we, in order for the hello world the mpi hello world we need to have mpi libraries and an MPI compiler inside the image. Once this is taken care of, we just copy the source code into a hello MPI directory and then just call make. So as you can see, there is nothing extravagant or out of the ordinary in compiling MPI applications inside docker images it's just a matter of having the dependencies and then building the building the code as you would do natively let's say um maybe just just another note here i use again copy to import the source the the sources but this is something specific to this example and basically the vast majority of the time the way to get application sources inside um, application or library sources uh, into contain into docker images is to retrieve them re uh, from an archive in the in the internet or do a or clone a git repository so run wget 
uh, run, git, clone, whatever. So the copy here is just for the sake of this example. I have already uh, for for convenience to save some time, I have already uh, I have already built this image, and I keep making mistakes. And here it is. My MPI Hello World image. And to show that it works, I do again docker run. This time, uh, although uh, docker run, but this time I will add an, uh, an, uh, a small uh, CLI option with minus minus RM. What this option will do is that it will remove the container after it has exited. So this is the way that you execute containers without having to remove them beforehand. So you just add minus minus RM to Docker run. So I complete the image identifier and then I remember that the hello world program is under hello MPI and this is the executable. Oh, I have to add the MPI launcher. So MPI run and request four processes because four seems like a, a good number. Let's run and here it is. Hello world from all four ranks. So we just executed an MPI application from inside a Docker container. And thanks to the minus minus RM option, we have no container left behind. Okay, so this is uh, regarding MPI. Uh, regarding the part, uh, now on to speaking a little bit about NVIDIA GPUs support inside Docker. So I have a slide for this, uh, just to be a to, to, just to explain the concepts a little bit clearer. But give me one second to bring it up. Okay, so for using NV if we're using NVIDIA GPUs in Docker, we need to um, we need basically two components. The first one is the GPU accelerated application, like uh, the application that we want to package into the container image, and this has to be built in the image with all its dependencies. So nothing new here. The thing we have been repeating all the way along. Uh, however, if you are using CUDA for your application, this also means that the CUDA toolkit has to be installed in the image. And especially if you're not familiar with it, this can be, um, this can, this can, it's maybe not straightforward. And so to simplify this task, NVIDIA already provides base images for uh, which already feature the CUDA compilers and the, the CUDA runtime and all the accelerated libraries. So, and they're available at this Docker Hub repositories. Uh, so it's just hubdocker.com and you look for NVIDIA slash CUDA. And what this means is that you, uh, a Docker file can be jump started by just uh, opening with, by using from NVIDIA CUDA and you already have everything that you need to 
um, to work with CUDA applications. The second uh, component that we the second component that we need in order to use GPUs from Docker containers is the GPU driver. And here things get a little bit more complicated because the driver by its nature it is tied to the hardware and it cannot be part of a portable image because if we included the driver in the image then that would mean that we will have an, an image that can only run on computers which have an hardware compatible with the driver and this is not good this is contrary to the best practices of having portable images so the GPU driver has to be injected into the container at the moment of its creation thankfully Nvidia uh, comes to our uh, help here as well be, uh, with uh, with a create with the um, development of what's called the Nvidia Container Toolkit. So the Nvidia Container Toolkit is an open source software uh, which is uh, with a reference hosted at this uh, GitHub repo. Uh, slash NVIDIA Docker, maybe I can show it to you just for the sake of completeness. Um, as I was saying, there is this uh, NVIDIA Docker component that acts as a plugin to Docker and it's able to expose the GPU devices and the GPU driver um, why uh, to docker inside contain so that it can be used inside containers um, yeah uh, by the by the container applications so I am here on on a on another computer which has installed uh, an Nvidia GPU with a working driver and I also have docker with the with, with the latest version the latest version of docker already has uh, native support for this kind of Nvidia docker plugin and the user of the Nvidia container toolkit so what I can do is to use uh, is to use a specific command line option which is called docker run minus minus gpus and i can pass and i can i can add a value to say which gpus from the host system i can expose into the container in this case let's make all of them I have only one GPU in this in this computer and run the the Nvidia SMI uh, program which will print information about which will use the Nvidia driver to print information about the available GPUs but this time it's inside the container and as you can see this runs just fine so if we want to try not uh, any container where, but we want to try a CUDA application here I have a small docker file just an example I start uh, uh, from the NVIDIA official image for CUDA 10 in the runtime and use the package manager to install the CUDA samples and then I just call make to compile some of the sample programs to have just a, a baseline uh, where to um, to have some baseline programs where I uh, and play around a little bit with my with my GPU so I already compile I already built this image so let's try to run it with docker run minus minus rm minus minus gpus all 
The identifier for this image is ETH CSS CUDA samples 10.0. And then, and I want to run the utility sample called device query, which will basically print uh, an, uh, an overview of the technical characteristics of available GPUs in the system. And here it is. You can see that the Quadro K110 1100M uh, on this computer has been correctly recognized. Could a driver version 11 with the runtime with the runtime version 10, and that's it. If we want to do something more interesting, instead of using a device the device query program, we can run we can run uh, a simulation. You can run the end body program, so a small, a small program simulating gravitational interactions between a group of bodies. You execute in benchmark mode with double precision. And with a number of bodies of 5,000 let's say. And here it is. It runs and it achieves like 12 gigaflop per second at, at this interaction. So this is so th this is the way that you can run GPU programs with Docker uh, and basically verify that they run before scaling them to production systems. Um, okay, so this basically concludes the, um, the first part of, uh, of, of the lecture. Let me just bring back the the slides, so I can so so we can recap some information. So. Um, as I said, these slides uh, which, uh, and the lab material, which will let you go over, uh, basically uh, go over everything that I've shown you, everything except the uh, CUDA GPU example, because that would, that would um, mean that we have to expose the GPU through the virtual machine, and that is kind of problematic especially because we cannot be sure that uh, everybody has an NVIDIA GPUs. But everything else that I've shown you, uh, how to pull images, how to create Docker files, uh, how to push images, how to manage uh, containers running on your, on your computer, and even a little bit more like a, a couple, a bit of Docker uh, of uh, good practices the MPI examples, they're all available in the lab material. And they're introduced very nicely by the video made by Simon. Uh, if you want to uh, deepen your knowledge of Docker, uh, one of the first places to look for is the official Docker documentation, as shown here. This is another very good resource, the best practices for writing Docker files. It, go, it, it, it explains a lot more than I was able to go through uh, uh, today. And this is my contra contact email address if you want to ask me things directly. Uh, so 
With that said, let me, I will try to answer a couple of questions and then we can go have our break. Um, see a question from, from Milena. You're building images on top of Debian Buster. How many layers can we build like this? Uh, an image on top of an image. So I remember that years ago in earlier versions of Docker, there was, um, there was a limit uh, in the number of layers. I believe it was maybe 42. Somebody was being a nerd there or maybe 100. But I believe that that limit has greatly increased to the point where it should not be an, an issue. I don't know if, uh, if, there is, if it's been completely removed, but it should be a relatively high number so that in 99.9% .9 of cases, it's not an issue. Um, of course, there is a trade-off uh, here that you should try to achieve a compromise uh, you should you shouldn't try to build too many layers into a single Docker file uh, just for the readability of the Docker file. But it, it, it's all a balance between the complexity of the single instructions and the amount of layers. So, more to the point of your question, generally there is no. You shouldn't hit a limit on Docker layers anytime soon. Uh, there is, I see a question from Jean. The MPI run command on your Docker example worked as if it was on a single node. Yes, and in fact, it was on a single node. How can we use multiple nodes? Uh, I will show that to you in the second part of a lecture where we will use an HPC specific container engine uh, on a high performance system. Generally, you would, if you want to run on multiple nodes, uh, you either launch, use the NPA launcher from outside Docker, but then you have to have the containers communicate between themselves. And with Docker, then you have to set up the network. It's not very straightforward. Uh, if you have access to a high performance system with HPC specific container engines like um, uh, like uh, Singularity or Saurus or Shifter, that becomes uh, that becomes easy, almost as seamless as uh, operating the system natively. Uh, there is a question from Alab uh, Benjamin Alabi Alabi Benjamin. Sorry if I don't get your name right. How do we, how to install a package from a container on someone's system? Um, I don't understand. I'm sorry. I, I'm not sure I understand the question completely. You mean if you can take something from inside a container and into an actual system? Um, um, well, that's not the intended usage of containers. They are not meant to be vessels to bring stuff into actual, uh, they're not meant to be executable packages or installable packages. They're meant to be isolated environments. So what is inside the container stays inside the container. And the container has everything that's needed to run a specific application. So, and, contain, and the images should be tailored exactly to satisfy the needs of one application and possibly one application only. So, the on, so you don't bother of taking what's inside an image outside because you shouldn't. That's not what they're meant for. There is, um, there is no straightforward way of doing that. Uh, I hope I explain this clearly enough. Uh, um, 
I see a question from Alina. If we want to use an existing image, how can we test beforehand that our system can support it? Um, interesting question. Um, well, generally, um, I, w I wouldn't say, I don't know of any specific way of seeing it, but basically, it's not that the uh, it's not that the images themselves have requirements because what the images represent is just a software stack with an application inside. Now, what are the runtime requirements of that application? Uh, well, it depends on not just on the application itself, but how 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 you use it. Um, example, you can run a simulation software with a small input file and that will use X memory, but if you start the simulation with a huge input file, it will likely consume 10 times X or something like that. So it, 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 so it really depends. Um, it, it, I, don't, I don't think it, the requirements depend on the Im images themselves. It's more because the images are just the, the application. Then you should look into uh, what kind of application is providing that image. And use, usually the, the identifier with the tag or the Docker Hub page for the images give you, if they are official images for which the web pages of the Docker Hub are quite curated, uh, they give you insights of what's inside. And if you, have, if you have access to the Docker file, maybe to a Git rep or somewhere, um, you can look into the Docker file to understand what's been built inside an image. OK, uh, we are 10 minutes over time. And and I would say that it's to get our breaks. Uh, to get our break, and we will be returning in 15 minutes' time. So uh, it's a in at 15:25 uh, UK time. So thank you very much for your attention. See you all in 15 minutes for the second part of the lecture. Thank you, Professor.